get your gun, get your gun. Back in on the run, on the run, on the run. Yeah, I'm calling you and me. Every son of liberty. Or in a way, no delay, go to bed. Make your daddy glad to have a head such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to find to be proud there by the line. Over there, over there, send the water, send the water over there. That the boys are coming, the boys are coming, the run, run, coming everywhere. Up, up, Say a prayer, send the water, send the water to be where we'll be over, we are coming over, and we won't come back any Je suis Olita Ne Jour Marie Christides. What? You don't speak French? Well, what I just said was I am Olita. Born Jour, that's my maiden name. Married name, Christides. <laughs> and what memories these bring. Why, I recall we used to have to have these always on our chair right alongside the switchboard. The men weren't so fortunate. They had to have them with them at all times. Even the horses had gas masks. It reminds me of a British song I learned. Gassed last night, gassed the night before. Gonna get gassed tonight if we never get gassed anymore. They're warning us, they're warning us. One gas mask for just the four of us. <laughs> well, we didn't have that problem, although, you know, an interesting thing, the men at first had gas masks that had a filter with charcoal in it. It gave them like black lung disease. So they changed the gas masks. Ah, oh, what an adventure. I promise I won't give you any more French, but you already heard Caruso singing in English and in French. And uh, <laughs> he did want us to go over there, and we did. We went over there if we were bilingual telephone operators. We were what was known as hello girls. But I was an ordinary girl. I, I graduated from Marine City High School. My family was French Canadian, so I knew French, but I paid the parish priest to teach me proper Parisian French, continental French. And so I learned that. And the other thing I did was, well, on weekends, my brother Wallace and I, we were weekend musicians throughout the, the thumb of Michigan. <sighs> we knew we wouldn't make enough of a living that way. Later on after the war, Wallace came back and he joined the Detroit Police Department but he was in a barbershop quartet singing with the police and representing them. As for me, well, I knew I needed a career too, and so I became a telephone operator with Michigan Bell, working on the switchboard and eventually training switchboard operators, which, well, that was the highest supervisory position we could have. <sighs> How did I know that was going to lead to so much it was going to lead to me eventually getting in uniform. And uh, it was because, well, here in the United States, we had 14 phones for every 100 people. Over in France, there was only one and a half telephones for every 100 people. And well, I suppose I should tell you that uh, we needed switchboard operators. We had to plug you in so that you went, your call went through. It wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that you could dial directly. Oh, 
So much changed, so much, including the fact that President Wilson didn't want us to get into World War I, although we didn't know that was going to be World War I. We thought it was the war to end all wars. And uh, then the Lusitania was sunk. The Germans started to sink all ships. There are rumors that it was carrying armaments. I can't say about that. I just know that American citizens were, were killed. And we had to go to war. The war to end all wars, we called it. <sighs> well, all sorts of things changed. He appointed one general, and that general died before he could even serve. So he appointed General Pershing. They called him Blackjack Pershing. Well, that was because he had served with our African-American soldiers out west, and he was a little bit different. He insisted our men won't go and be part of the French and the British filling in where they needed us. Oh, no, we were the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF, and we trained. He had soldiers trained for three months until they finally went over there. He had other ideas like, um, well... You see, we didn't go in because the French army had already mutinied. And as for the Russians, <laughs> they had a revolution and practically went back home. So we were to end a three-year stalemate. The war was going nowhere. Oh, we weren't part of the French. We weren't part of the British. We weren't part of anybody but ourselves. And... Um, <laughs> We also were barely part of the French phone system. They, they had two-hour delays before a call could go through, and sometimes there were abrupt cutoffs. No, he wanted the, the voice with a smile. Ah. Now, take a look at this name of a town. Our men called it <laughs> Benoity Vox. And they certainly weren't about to parlez-vous with the operators there and talk politely. They wanted to get in touch with somebody, and they wanted it now. So General Pershing asked for the voice with the smile, as we Bell Telephone operators were known as. And the word went out through the newspapers all across the country. Well, everybody operated who could but not everybody was free, so he wanted French, he wanted bilingual telephone operators, and while a 700 applied, only 332 were accepted, and by the time all actually happened, well, they started out saying you had to be 25 to 35 years old without a husband over there. By the time they finally brought it down to 20, I just barely made it. A little teenage telephone operator and weekend musician was going to go over there. Now, there were seven units that were put together. I was in the sixth, and we wound up being the last to go abroad. Oh, it was a great adventure. Only 223 actually went abroad. And we went to 75 cities and villages. There were a few in Britain, in Southampton. London, and also in uh, Winchester. But, well, we went along and uh, we stopped the men from having to be telephone operators. They thought it was women's work. They would much rather the Signal Corps. You may notice my uniform has the Signal Corps. Well, there it is, the Signal Corps insignia. And uh, the Signal Corps, it got started with flags and Lights, that was their way of operating and telling people. And eventually, well, they would take messengers, be they mounted or on foot. But, well, you see, that wasn't working very well. And so the men had to use the telephone wires. And they did. They took the French wires, and then they strung even more wires. You see, well, there were... There were telephone wires that were all throughout France. There, by the time we were done, there were 1,700 miles, and, and then we added more. We leased some from the French, 
and we put on existing and new poles. And well, by the time the French leased and maintained and, and our wires and telephone poles, why, we had about 38,000 miles of telephone all throughout France. Oh, thinking about all of those numbers. <laughs> you know what really made the most interest to me? was the cost of my uniform. Why, we were modeled after the army nurses. And the army didn't have any plans for us, so we had to have our uniforms made. Now, out on the East Coast, I'm told that the big department stores would make the uniforms for the women. In Marine City, I went to Miss Duddy. And she made my uniform. <laughs> It cost from $300 to $500, and I looked that up. In a nowadays money, why that's, um, well, it's about anywhere from 50, a little over $5,200 to almost um, $7,000 roughly. And, um, well, actually, a little about, more about $8,767, I believe I was told. Is it any wonder that out in Emmett, Idaho, there was a woman who had to have a benefit thrown for her. Her name was Ann Campbell, uh, later on Atkinson. And Ann Campbell, she couldn't afford that money. We all were, well, most of us were telephone operators, although I have to tell you, they were so desperate, they even trained women to be telephone operators down in, in Indiana. And uh, so those telephone operators may have started out as rich society ladies who spoke French or went to French schools abroad, or they may have been au pairs, little nannies, who uh, were here from France, and they learned how to be telephone operators too. Well, I didn't have that problem, but I did need to have a uniform made. <laughs> we had black woolen underwear that I'm not about to show you, something else I, we weren't about to wear, for our modesty's sake, we had black sateen bloomers. <laughs> well, we didn't bother with those. Something else we didn't bother with was this armband. It said that we were non-combatants so that the Germans theoretically weren't supposed to fire at us. It started out, well, do you know what that symbol is? That symbol, if you look on the telephone, you will see that symbol. Because there it is, it's the mouthpiece. We were the mouthpiece. But, you know, keeping these things clean in wartime, well, that was a bit difficult. Some of our women lived in, in sheds and over shops and barns. So eventually, well, we went to military insignia. By the way, that red, white, and blue is not the American red, white, and blue. That's the French colors that says I served in France. And I had... Well, I was a private, and I served for one year. <laughs> oh, what memories all of that is. But I have to tell you, we didn't earn very much, at least not by today's standards. We went anywhere from, well, $60 a month up to $72 for the supervisors. That was comparable to what the Army nurses made. That was a month. And uh, our overall supervisor, her name was Grace Banker, she earned the princely sum of $120. Grace Banker was our boss. <laughs> she went over in the first group, but many of the women had to train so that they learned how to be switchboard operators. And the rest of us, well, we all had to go through being military, proper military. So we had to go through physical exams, psychological exams. Would you believe the Secret Service even investigated us? I'm told one woman was taken off right as she was about to get on board the boat. Oh, the Navy always insisted we call them ships. She was about to get on shipboard. Well, back in Evanston, Illinois, or Indiana, how could I say that? But back in Evanston, we had to learn to march. We had to stand inspection. And it's a good thing I learned how to stand inspection, as you will find out. But we had to do all of that. And we had to sleep in barracks. We had to adjust to the fact that our mail was military mail. And uh, our hospitalization came with the Army. 
and we were told we could be court-martialed if we did anything wrong. And that was very important, as I will definitely tell you. Well, eventually my time came. Now, my brother Wallace and I, we had each taken our oaths before, but once I got on that ship, I had to take my oath again. And there was no contract signed. That's important. I want you to remember that. We signed no contracts. We did the full military oath of office. And we got on board the ship and we learned that we were there. We had said we'd be there for the duration of the war. And we were told, we were told that it might last 10 years. Well, I have to tell you, I was real glad I wasn't part of the first group because they were confined to their quarters on board that ship except when they came out for lifeboat drills or to eat. And the, that was only with the officers because we could only associate with them. Well, by the time my little unit number six went through, I was able to find a lifeboat and just sob to the heavens because 10 years, I'd be 30. I'd be an old maid. Oh. How I wondered, was this the thing I should have done? Well, eventually, eventually we got to Winchester, and we didn't get to go over into France right away. Oh, no. We were quarantined for two weeks. Quarantined, you may wonder why. Well, the Spanish influenza killed, I believe, as many, maybe more men. It was especially terrible for young adults. And so we were quarantined for two weeks. Well, <laughs> while I was there, I did what any musician would do. I played the piano. You can't very well do it right now, but I have to say that I played the piano and one of the Red Cross ladies came up to me and asked, wouldn't you like to do like your brother's doing? Now, later on this became the USO, but my brother, well, he was out singing for the troops all around. I said I couldn't or I'd be court-martialed because I'd taken my oath. Oh, we adjusted eventually in that two weeks to a new diet also. We had to adjust to saccharin, no sugar, and uh, there was no coffee. It was roasted, uh, roasted, roasted barley. Oh, and no sweets. Oh, no sweets at all. No bakery goods. Oh, we had to get used to all of this. And then we hopped on little steamer packets and we made our way across the channel. But just as on the ship we had lifeboat drills because we could have been sunk by the subs, we had to zigzag our way across this channel. So it took us two days to get over there. And then we landed in Paris. Now, I'm told the first group of us back on March and this was, by that time, a year after we had entered the war. Well, almost a year, one short one month. March of 1918, they landed in a heavy air, air drill. And they'd had, well, they'd been confined to quarters. They'd had all kinds of things. And so the women at the YWCA said that they had to soothe ruffled feathers for snoring roommates or lost hairpins. Well, it wasn't that bad for us. In fact, we looked upon the YWCA's Hotel Petrograd as the greatest place to take a leave of absence. <laughs> well, it was a long way from when we had been in, in camp and we had learned to march and stand inspection. Irving Berlin had been a soldier, too, and he wrote a song that, well, it, it represented it so well. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I wish I could stay in bed. Oh, but the strongest thing of all is to hear the bugler's call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up, because it's morning. Someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday they're going to find him dead. I will step upon his reveille and amputate it heavily and spend the rest of my time in bed. <laughs> well, many a girl wanted to have her leave of absence at the Hotel Petrograd with those YWCA ladies. There was even one from Ann Arbor. Her name was Lulu Taylor. Oh, the Hotel Petrograd was wonderful. They had hot baths. 
If you're off in a village in France, you envy the hot baths and even their steam baths. Oh, and the sunshine rooms. The sunshine rooms were wonderful. They had pianos there that I could play, or, or if you didn't play an instrument, you could crank up the old Victrola and listen to Caruso singing over there in English and French. Oh, or you could, there were sewing areas and there were writing tables. And if you didn't want to do any of that, just wonderful chairs, stuffed armchairs with books and magazines. It was heaven. But, of course, we didn't stay there. We had to get out to our, our places where we, were, where we were supposed to be. Now, I, sus I suspect it was because I was the youngest that I was sent off to headquarters. And they watched me at Chaumont. Pershing didn't want to have his, his headquarters in Paris. Oh, no, he wanted to be near the men. We were 150 miles away from Paris on the Marne River. And uh, we were in the old former Russian barracks. This was a stone fortress, and it was right there at Chaumont. And we had right down on the first floor, we had a little, little office. And in there was our switchboard. Oh, memories of all of that make me feel like that British song, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile. Smile, smile. Oh, I probably need to explain. While you've a Lucifer, was the matches, while you've a Lucifer to light your fag. Smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It never is worthwhile. And we didn't. We were delighted to be there and helping out our boys. We were helping them out with code words, things like, well, we called some locations things like Wabash or Waterfall or Podunk. Oh, and the, the units, why, there was Nemo and Uncle and, oh, let's see, what was another one? Uh, oh, Jam! You know, one of the girls swore that we sounded like we were in Alice in Wonderland and we'd fallen down the rabbit hole. Well, eventually, one of the, the requests was for a little bit closer to the front. They needed some women who would go with Grace Banker out to just 15 miles from the front. Well, everybody volunteered, but she took five operators with her, and off they went, and they were right near the front. Oh, what things they went through. You know, she had to go to sleep. She had only five women with her, and so they had to keep things going around the clock. And so you can imagine, they were working all the time. And one night, she, she collapsed into bed, into her cot. And, well, she didn't realize the shed she was living in had a drip. She was so exhausted, she didn't realize until the next morning that the, the water had fallen on her feet, and they had swollen overnight. She couldn't even put on her shoes. Nobody complained that she wasn't in regulation boots. Well, then... Because they were so close to the front, there was shelling. And it was coming closer and closer to the switchboard. Now, we had switchboards that the Germans didn't have. There was a gentleman from, from Michigan. Major General Squire had us with multiplexing switchboards. We could have more than one conversation per cable. And that made us in better shape, but not when you're being fired upon. And so, well, they were eventually told, Get out of there! Get out of there or you'll be court-martialed! Well, eventually, when the shell hit the switchboard and it caught on fire, they got out. <laughs> Later on, they came back and only one-third of their switchboard was left. Well, they received certificates for their work and Grace Bank Banker, well, she received the Distinguished Service Medal. That's important, too, along with those contracts I mentioned. Well. This was all less than a month before the war was over. You see, it was the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour that we heard La Guerre, c'est fini! Oh, I promised I wasn't going to do any more French, but I bet you figured it out. It meant the war is over. Oh, we were so happy to hear it. Well, 
We stayed in Chaumont for a full year afterwards because we had to make arrangements to get our men out. And uh, some of those women who were near the front, it was boring after that. They volunteered to go into occupied Germany to make all the different connections they had to do, but they didn't stay as long as we did. Well, you know, we were supposed to be safe. We were supposed to be non-combatants. But the Navy recognized its yeomanettes. And when our women came for that ticker tape parade, you may have seen the picture of down in New York with all of the flags flying and everything else. Our women were there in uniform, ready to march with the men. And they were told they couldn't, that they weren't soldiers. Well, the Army claimed we were contract employees. There were more important things to handle, and so we fought it for decades. We fought it, and we fought it. <sighs> Merle Egan Anderson out in Helena, Montana, and Grace Banker, they went and they talked about things like our being told we could be court-martialed and, and that Distinguished Service Medal. But, well, the 19th Amendment was a little bit more important, getting women the vote, and then, well, there was the Depression, and then World War II, and, you know, it wasn't, it took us 60 years, it wasn't until President Carter that finally, well, Merle Egan, by this time, Anderson, moved to Seattle, and she found a lawyer by the name of Mark Huff, and I've always said a woman's place is in the House and the Senate, she also found Representative Jane, um, Jane, what was her name? Jane, oh dear, I've forgotten. Oh, Representative Edith Rogers. And Edith Rogers was the one who got President Carter to sign that, that declaration that we were actual soldiers. By that time, there were only 50 to 75 of us alive, and of that, very few of us, only 18 of us had actually served abroad. And we weren't in any shape to go to Washington, D.C. and receive our promised victory medal. <laughs> yes, I received my victory medal. But, you know, we had been important. Maybe you wonder, why was it that we didn't have radios used? Well, in World War II, they used them a great deal. But you know, the radios, well, our men fought in trenches. And if the radio was at one end or at the other, they'd interfere with each other. So that's why they had to use messengers. And well, maybe you've heard of the Lost Battalion. The Lost Battalion needed something else. The British donated, I think it was something like, um, mm, maybe 15,000 passenger pigeons, trained pigeons to carry messages. The Lost Battalion was off in the Argonne Forest and they were behind German lines and they couldn't get out. They were with their back up against a cliff and after a week, their food ran out and also there was friendly, friendly fire coming at them and so they needed to get the word out. They also had to tell their men that they couldn't go off to the river to get water because it was strictly rainwater because if they ran off to the river, those German sharpshooters were shooting them and killing them. It was so bad, they even took the hospital supplies off of any of the men who were killed so that they had enough to bind up wounds and things like that. Well, they sent off one passenger pigeon with the message, many wounded, we cannot evacuate. They sent off a second passenger pigeon because the first one was shot down by the Germans. Men are suffering, can support be sent? He was also shot down. Well, eventually they were down to their final passenger pigeon. They called that pigeon, Cher Ami. It means dear friend. That's male, by the way. And um, this was the message. We are along the road parallel to 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it! Well, poor Cherami went up in the air and down because it was shot. 
and the men thought, that's our last hope. Eventually, dear cher ami was able to lift up and fly when the Germans weren't looking. Cher ami had a shattered breastbone, had one eye missing, one leg, and you know pigeons only have two. It had one leg barely hanging by a tendon, but it got that message through. You know, they gave that pigeon a medal and they retired it. It only lived a few more months and then they sent it off to the Smithsonian to be stuffed. <laughs> Cher Ami turned out to be female, another woman working for the military. Well, we had one woman, one of our hello girls as they called us, those of us who had the voice with a smile and the men cheered when they finally heard our voice instead of the French operators who didn't appreciate Benoit Vox for a pronunciation. Well, she was from, she was from Hillsdale. Cora Bartlett was our only hello girl casualty. She was on a, a caisson with her, her casket draped with the American flag and flowers drawn by horses through the streets of Chaumont and through being buried over there. Later on, I got together with the operators. There were five of them from Detroit and one more from Hillsdale before she went off to New Jersey to get married. And we had a memorial service. But Cora Bartlett is buried over there. And she didn't die from a German sniper. Oh, no. She died from typhoid fever. Now, the, the military would be glad to say that they practically eliminated that. They did. Their men were sh given inoculations. They were vaccinated for it. Typhoid fever comes from poor hygiene, and she died of it, while our soldiers did not. Well, eventually, I received that promised victory medal. It was brought to my home in Marine City by that time I was married. My last name was Christides and I was given it, as well as my promised honorable discharge. We were told only those of us who were alive qualified as soldiers with veteran status. Many of us had been trying to join the veterans organizations and that's another way we found out we didn't qualify. Well, Brigadier General Arthur Wolf brought this to me. I looked at it and I said, Maybe I should sue for back pay. He didn't laugh. <laughs> well, I have to say it was a great adventure. How many young women get a chance to do things like that? I have to say I agreed with that song that came out. Now, later on, Eddie Cantor made quite a hit of it. But this was the version we heard about, how you're going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris. Ruben, Ruben, I've been thinking, said his wifey dear. Now that all is peaceful and calm, the boys will soon be back on the farm. Mr. Ruben started winking and slowly rubbed his chin. He pulled his chair up close to mother and he asked her with a grin, How you gonna keep him down on the farm after they seen Harry? How you gonna keep him away from Broadway, jumping around and painting the town? How you gonna keep him away from harm? That's a mystery. They'll never want to see a rake or plow. And who the deuce can call you a cow? How you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Harry?